Hello. Let's see. So let's go from a share screen. Do, 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 do. Yeah. All right. So a uh, couple of things. First, I want to make sure that my Zoom is actually recording me. I think it is. Um, I think it is. All right. Well, I hope I don't have to do this twice. But uh, a couple of things. One, your exam on Thursday, October 8th. Your next exam is on November 12th. Your Thursday exam, is, October 8th, is going to have about 35 questions on it. I'll give you about 70 minutes to take the exam. Um, I'll make the exam go live in the early afternoon on Thursday, and then you guys will have until 7 p.m. to complete it. You will have, it'll be time, the questions will appear in randomized order, the answers will appear in randomized order. Um, I will be available to answer questions live on Zoom via my um, regular, our regular uh, scheduled class time. I should also convey that um, Wednesday's class, I will devote to answering questions. Very few of you have shown up to office hours, and it, I've, I've learned that some of you, no, no surprise, have uh, decided or have you know been committed to other factors or procrastinated, as is inevitable. Everyone's procrastinating. I'm procrastinating too, rest assured. It's no judgment from me, but it's because I realized that many of you are just now watching these videos, like in these last few days, or <laughs> possibly the last week. Uh, or mightn't have been studying all that much, it occurs to me that my, many of you might have questions and we don't have any office hours that will elapse between now and your exam. So <laughs> I figure what we should do is I should have you um, have a question and answer session with me on Wednesday for about an hour during our regular class schedule, our regularly scheduled class time. So um, please do come to that. I'll send out a Zoom invitation to everyone immediately beforehand and then um, We'll see who shows up. And if you don't, if you don't have any questions, <laughs> you don't have to come. In fact, many of you might not even have any awareness that, <laughs> that this offer has been extended because you might be watching this video, I don't know, Thursday morning. <laughs> anyway, no judgment. <laughs> I, I was a student too, and I still procrastinate all the time. Anyway. So uh, this unit is all about territoriality and aggression. So um, questions that we will um, interrogate together will include what is aggression? What is territoriality? What are the factors that determine how much individuals will fight over resources, for territories, for mates, for social status, etc.? Then what are the mechanisms that individuals use to infer what they're capable of <laughs> in the landscape of, uh, of combatants? How strong or weak are you? And so in, in turn, how much should you fight for this resource or should you just throw in the towel because the jig is up. Uh, then we'll talk about dear enemy effects and some basic learning phenomena that can mediate levels of aggression among familiar individuals. And then lastly, we'll talk about how much individuals know when they're part of a hierarchy. So do they know who's beneath them? Do they know who's above them? Do they know their precise position? Do they know who their uh, most approximate rivals are immediately above them or below them in the hierarchy? And then how do you infer any of that? Because fish can't tell you what they know, right? You can't give them little questionnaires or like one-on-one -on -one meetings. You can't talk to their parents. So what do you do to try to figure out what an animal knows when they're quite secretive about it? So even though we're talking about the evolution of sociality in this class, you know, living in cooperative societies and cooperative breeders and you social insect societies and integrated highly social networks, like uh, social networks like, like a humans endure, um, cities, uh, these, sorts of, these sorts of phenomena. The thing is, is that even though animals live in groups, of course they have aggression because every individual in the group is selected to try to reach the ascendant position, which presumably confers reproductive and survival benefits. So one of the most common ways to assert yourself in the hierarchy of social life is to fight <laughs> other individuals and to try to stake your claim. Right, even in highly, highly used social insects, where the individuals are developmentally determined to be non-reproductive or highly reproductive, there's still some fuzziness about how much reproduction individuals can sneak in. Because even though worker bees are incapable of producing female offspring, which have a genomic contribution from a mother and a father, 
workers can still lay unfertilized eggs. So even though those little sterile females have never been inseminated in their lives, they can still live, they can still produce um, eggs that have no father, have are haploid, and then give rise to males. So why don't workers do that? Some workers do do that, especially when they're not in queen right colonies. When the queen has perished, sometimes the colony's best option, an individual's best option is just to lay as many unfertilized eggs as you can, produce as many males as possible, and then during the next mating flight, shunt those out into the mating flight and try to mate with the queens from other colonies. So who gets to lay those eggs? Who's going to be the pseudo queen once the queen goes away? Who, what deciphers that dominance hierarchy? Ants and bees will both engage in pretty aggressive interactions with other their colony mates in the absence of a queen to try to pick that pseudo queen position of which there may only be one or a few. And then the rest of the workers are just gonna be doing their normal thing, rearing the male offspring that have no father of their sisters. <clears throat> anyway, it's a weird world. All right. Uh, reproductive subordinates and cooperative breeders. Yeah, no joke. Guess what? Well, when the dominants die or when they're no longer physically capable of suppressing your reproductive output, guess what you're going to do as a helper? You're going to try to assert yourself. You're going to try to become that dominant individual, try to force out the existing dominant individual or beat off your rivals when there's an abdication and the dominant individuals perish. You can try to assert your dominance and make sure you're the next breeder. Don't wait. You might not live until tomorrow. Okay, and then finally, new group members regularly have to evaluate where they're going to be in a dominance hierarchy, in a social hierarchy, and the way that they do that is by fighting with local combatants, fighting who, pardon me, with existing group members who um, need to figure out where this new individual is going to stand in the hierarchy, and then whether or not they're going to have to be subservient or whether they're going to be dominant over them, and Despite all these benefits of asserting yourself, attaining a preferable position, um, becoming a dominant individual inside of these societies, a reproductive individual, selection still generally favors for everyone involved to spend the least amount of effort possible to figure out who's in charge, right? So even though I really want to be the dominant individual, and I have inferior quality to you, and you want to be the dominant individual, and you're of much higher quality than me, in terms of your ability to hold resources, you're in better condition, you're stronger, you're bigger, whatever. Neither of us wants to spend any more time than is absolutely necessary to figure out that you're stronger than me. I need to figure this out early so you don't injure me, and you need to figure this out early so that you don't waste your time uh, fighting with me when you can use those calories for anything else recovering from diseases, fighting off diseases, uh, fighting off more relevant combatants, inseminating females, impressing females, excavating, whatever, all those other somatic things and reproductive things that you should be doing with your calories, you do not want to waste them fighting me. So you need to work it out early. It's in both of our interests to figure out who's in charge, who's reproducing, and then who is the infertile loser. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> all right, so first things first, what is territoriality? What is dominance? And uh, where do these terms even come from? So first, what is a home range? A home range is the space over which an individual spends the majority of its life. And the way that we normally do this <clears throat> is we put some sort of tracker on individuals or we just watch them wandering around in the landscape. And we just say, where are they each time that we find them? And we plot on a map each and every point where we find those individuals. And then we make basically a minimum convex polygon in this map that captures the space where we regularly see that individual. And we'll have like a density map, right? Like it's usually over here, but occasionally it's over here. And you'll have like a little density map that shows on a real map where this individual tends to spend its time. That is its home range. Normally there's some sort of burn off like where they spend 95% of their time or where they spend 80% of their time. I mean, even though individuals have a home range they tend to be, occasionally they go gallivanting off for reasons that will not always be clear, but then they usually go back to their home range. And so we have a burn off. So like, although we've seen them occasionally in other spots, this is where they generally occur. That is their home range where they are typically found. Minimum convex polygon map, some burn off. The burn off varies based on who's, um, who's evaluating it, but they'll articulate it in their analysis. And then that's where individuals tend to spend their time. Within that home range is a smaller territory. And that is a subsection of this larger home range that individuals, in, uh, oftentimes males, but sometimes females, defend against intrusion by rivals. So 
males will fight off other males that enter this uh, arena, or females will fight off rivals that enter this arena to try to get their food or to attack their mate or attack their uh, offspring. So it's a smaller section of the home range that individuals defend. Normally, there are resources inside of that smaller territory that are worth defending. Maybe this is a source of water and you live in an arid environment or where water is available irregularly. Maybe it's food. This is this really sweet spot. It has lots of food here. You should, you should defend it so that other individuals don't come in here and bogart your food. Or mates. I worked too hard <laughs> to secure all these mates. The last thing that I want is to have some interloper come along and <laughs> inseminate them at the last minute and sire all their offspring, right? So mates can also be a resource within your territory. And then the final thing is young. Um, con specifics and heterospecifics both, which may not be relevant to you in terms of predation, might still pack off, pick off your offspring. And so it can pay to defend your young from intrusion by rivals who might otherwise eat them. Territoriality. So why aren't all animals on Earth always territorial all the time? Lots of animals don't have any territoriality at all. They don't care. Well, it depends on what the resources are that they're defending. Food, water, mates, young. It depends on how abundant those resources are uh, and then how they're distributed through space, how persistent they are, and then how many rivals are around. So um, distribution is the first thing. So uniform distributions typically don't favor um, territoriality because why would you defend a place where it's basically equivalent to everywhere else? The resources that can be found in your patch here are as good, as abundant as just about anywhere. So why would you defend this? It's dumb. Why would a rival intrude and try to take anything from you because you're, pad your territory is not any better than anywhere else or what, what random distributions have an intermediate level that so sometimes that territoriality is favored under random distributions but really territoriality is most favored under clumps distributions so instances where resources are found in tight little chunks where there are lots of resources and everywhere else is pretty crappy there's water here but not lots of other places. There's food in this area, but it's rarer or absent in other places. Mates can be found here, but you can't just find mates anywhere. Or these are where my young are right now, and so I'm defending them, and they're clustered, they're clustered in this area, so I've got to defend these eggs, got to defend this nest, got to, have, got to defend these juvenile offspring, et cetera, et cetera. So clumped resources usually favor the evolution of territoriality. Second thing that you need to know is that um, the intensity of the resource influences how territorial individuals are. So if the resources are quite rare, then that means those clumps are really valuable. If the resources are incredibly abundant, well then it doesn't really pay to defend these resources because every other individual that shows up is not going to consume enough of these resources to imperil you. They're not going to um, they're not going to decrease your ability to acquire resources by their presence. There's more than enough to go around. So ideally, resources are scarce, they're clumped, and they're persistent, which means um, you, if you're defending a territory and it's only good for a couple of days and then its quality vanishes and some other place that was crappy becomes awesome, well, then why would you defend this territory? Because it's good today. By the time you become familiar with it, by the time you're able to defend it and kick off whatever rivals there, um, the patch might not be good anymore, right? The patch might be of low quality. So under those conditions, it pays to not really be all that territorial. So distribution, clumped. Intensity, low. Persistence, high. Not ephemeral. Those are the conditions that tend to favor territoriality. Okay, very high um, concentrations of conspecifics and very low concentrations of uh, conspecifics both can prohibit territoriality. So it's so, sort of intermediate value. Really, really high densities basically just favor territoriality because there's just so many rivals around all the time that you just would lose so much energy trying to defend anything. So really high densities. It's not worth to, to, to fighting anyone because there's a chance that like you'll never ever have time for anything else very very low density the argument goes that there aren't enough people individuals around to even to even fight against who why would you set up this territory because you might never have a rival show up so it's like this intermediate density that favors territoriality all right 
So dominance, uh, dominance hierarchies um, are sort of related to territoriality and aggression because basically individuals are trying to suss out social status as an important currency inside of a society. We need to figure out who's of the highest quality, who's of the lowest quality, who all the intermediates are, and then work out that social rank because the resource distribution that this group encounters and is able to farm from the land is going to be unevenly distributed. So high-ranking individuals tend to get more resources, more assistance, higher survival rates, greater reproductive output than their inferior, uh, lower-ranking counterparts. So dominance hierarchies emerge with high and low-ranking individuals. Um, and then once they're established, once we know who's who in this dominance hierarchy, which involves contests, then we don't have to fight anymore, right? I already know you're of higher quality than me. So if you start to fight me over something, I just, I defer, I get out of dodge, I go away. And if I'm higher ranking than you, and I can test a resource in front of you, you should defer and go away. It saves our whole group time and energy to work out who's high quality, who's low quality, and then just stop fighting with each other, right? Spend our time and energy doing anything else. And odds are we're, we're relatives too, right? So not only does it help me and you individually to save us time and energy, but it helps us with indirect fitness as well. So um, societies can be matrilineal, but sometimes they're patrilineal. So matrilineal societies like lemurs and baboons, these are more common kinds of animal societies where every single matriline is ranked relative to every other matriline in the hierarchy. So the highest ranking individual in the whole group of these lemurs, these ring-tailed lemurs on the right, is the oldest living female of that matriline. The second ranking individual are all of her daughters. The third ranking individual are all of their granddaughters tied in each of those ranking systems. Now, the top ranking and oldest female of the next matrilineal line is inferior to the youngest individuals of the matrilineal line in front of hers. And then it goes down to all of her, um, all of her descendants, grandmothers to mothers to daughters, etc. And then the next matrilineal line will have its most dominant and oldest female, and then all the way down from there. So they're age ranked within each matrilineal line, but the matrilineal lines are ranked one on top of the other, which might have many individuals in each of the generations. So it kind of sucks to be this really old and successful, presumably, um, dominant female within a matrilineal line, because the matrilineal line in front of you, the youngest female, generally of that next matrilineal line still holds social status over you and will you'll tend to defer to her in conflict doesn't feel right doesn't seem right whatever thank god we're not lemurs or veterans um occasionally these are male mediated hierarchies so on the right hand side here are male geladas where there are multi-level societies where there's like a king there's a king gelada that has many little sub harems then there are sort of like regional uh, then there are like little sub cliques of those that have like 12 to 16 females and one to two males that that um basically have reproductive purview over them and then there are lots of beta males that exist elsewhere so very few males actually get to mate inside of gelada societies um a small number of males actually hold dominant positions over small clusters of females, but then there are um, basically leader male individuals above them that go back and forth to different subgroups of female and basically inseminate whoever they want. But those males are quite rare. Those males immediately beneath them, which have the small clusters of harems of like 10 to 12 females, those are even quite rare because most of the males actually end up becoming non-reproductive until they're mature enough, old enough, strong enough, that they can hold either this very rare ascendant position, which almost no one ever occupies, or one of these males that is just beneath him and has some 10 to 12 females that he guards and reproduces with. Anyway, that's rarer, but it's at least, it's, it's common enough to mention that there are patrilineal societies. Well, they're not patrilineal, but patriarchal, male dominated. Okay, so hierarchies emerge from animal contests. So animal contests are ritualized encounters which have a series of signals and then behavioral interactions that escalate in severity. The goal of every individual involved is to spend the least amount of energy possible to figure out who's strong, who's weak, get out of there. So um, no one wants to pay superfluous cost. Everyone wants to figure out who's stronger than who. So we need to get out of Dodge early. The first stage of these is usually signaling. So we do something that involves no physical contact with us, but I just like, show you some bright color. 
on my frill or whatever. Or maybe I bounce up and down on a web and show you how heavy I am as a combatant. Or maybe I do a little dance on the, on the floor on a, and make seismic songs that you can feel the vibrations over there. Or I make some giant whooping call and you can hear how big my vocal sack is, right? Something about these remote signals that basically can show you how healthy I am, how strong I am, how big I am, how loud I am, and hopefully just that. If you call and I call, we can figure out, no, turns out you're like five times as big as me. So I'm just going to get out of here right now and go figure out another niche in life, right? Then there's, if that doesn't work out, so if individuals have a large asymmetry in this fish, uh, quality of this first signal, the contest ends almost immediately. But if they're close, if the combatants are both comparable, well then, it usually escalates to the next stage, which is a test of strength in a ritualized way. So a test of strength is usually like, okay, well, it's not clear who's the winner here, it's not clear who's stronger, so we're going to come into contact with each other, and now we're gonna test our strength against each other. The goal is not to injure each other in this encounter, but that can happen because we're actually in physical contact now, but we have to show each other one who's stronger than the other. Maybe we'll shove each other, or we'll do it against some sort of like, horn ramming or something like that, but we're not really trying to hurt each other, but we're trying to see, are you physically stronger than I am? Are you physically larger than I am? Or are you particularly crafty or whatever? And then if there's a large asymmetry, the contest ends there. So it's clear that you're stronger than me. I'm gonna get out of here right now. But if it's close, again, it can escalate to the next stage, which is normally pursuit. We're like, one of us actually begins to like chase and pursue the other in a semi-violent way, chasing you down and making it clear that we're actually going to engage in some sort of violent aggression if you don't depart. And ideally, this is basically just showing, it's like playing a game of chicken at this stage. We're close enough in string, we're close enough in single quality. Now I'm showing you like, I will actually not swerve this car. In this game of chicken, I am coming after you. And I like, who's gonna swerve? Not me. I'm gonna throw the wheel out of the, out of the window. I can't swerve. You gotta go. So this is basically them show, one of the combatants or multiple combatants showing the other one that in fact, we're gonna fight if you continue to stick around. And then the most highest level, of course, naturally, um, is violent aggression where they really do fight. They really do in, have a risk of injuring each other. And even, even high ranking individuals have a chance of getting hurt by some loser. And if you get hurt by some loser now, then relevant rivals tomorrow are almost certainly going to beat you. Even dominant, high ranking, strong individuals they don't want to engage in superfluous contest because there's a chance they'll get hurt or they'll lose. And then the next day, if you're hurt, if you're exhausted, if you've lost, mm, bad news. It's very likely that you are going to have reduced performance in subsequent encounters. And for some species, being injured severely once in a contest means you'll never reproduce ever again. You might starve to death. You'll get picked off by a predator. So it's in everyone's interest to save energy. Uh, to reduce risk of injury in these contests. And if we're relatives, if we're going to live in a social group after these contests are done, then it's especially important for us not to injure each other, for us not to compromise our group integrity, for us not to compromise meaningful social bonds or lose profitable individuals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So how severely do individuals fight? Depends on a lot of features. One, it depends on resource value. If the resource that we're fighting over is not that valuable, we're not gonna fight that hard for it, right? Because it's not that valuable. But if it's important, this is the only territory we're ever gonna have. And the territory is of high quality. I gotta fight hard for this because if it's high quality, it, it might imperil my life. It might remove my ability to reproduce if you take this resource from me. And conversely, if I'm able to take your sweet resources, well then I might be able to reproduce when I might otherwise not be able to. And so I should fight hard. Winning this resource might mean whether or not I can reproduce or whether I'm basically a living fossil. So resource value, it goes up, the level of aggression goes up in these contests. Resource holding potential. That's basically the quality of the individual, their, their ability to hold resources. Usually it's males. Resource holding potential high, high quality males hold large amounts of resources, can fight well, are strong, can reproduce, uh, are, more, are more likely to reproduce, higher HP, higher HP, there you go. Lower HP males 
sickly, measly, not very likely to reproduce very much, probably not going to hold a very nice territory. If they did, it was probably a chance event. Almost certainly it's going to get taken away from them. <laughs> Bad news bears. Normally they're sick or diseased or whatever. I'm probably a low H RHP male in the wild. All right. Um, condition, ability, asymmetry. So if there's a large asymmetry in um, RHP, God, I got something in my teeth. If there's a high, con uh, the high asymmetry in RHP, the contest typically is short. If there's low asymmetry in RHP, then the, then the contest usually persists to higher levels because it's not always clear who the high quality and low quantity combatants are. Resident effects. Individuals tend to fight harder for resources that they've held for a long time. If this is your territory, if this has been the territory that you've held the whole time, you're the resident and I'm the intruder, residents typically fight harder. They've invested more in that territory. They're familiar with it. They've built their web there. They built their nest there. They have their mates there, whatever. They've accumulated resources. They've consolidated them in that area. And so they are much less likely to give them up. Intruders, normally intruders are of lower body condition when they show up because they've been wandering around trying to find a place to steal or establish themselves. Also, they don't really know the quality of the environment that they're about to try to have a contest over. They might have a course assessment, but it's not perfect, and they haven't invested in it the same way that a resident has. So intruders typically aren't, fight, don't fight as hard as residents for a variety of reasons. And then winner loser effects. Individuals, once they win in a contest, are much more likely to win in subsequent contests, presumably because they think that they are of higher RHP, that they have greater potential to hold resources, and so they're more likely to escalate in subsequent encounters, and that's more likely to win them, well, those encounters, just because of their demonstration that they're willing to throw it all in to win this contest. Losers, the exact opposite happens. Individuals that lose contests tend to keep losing contests. Um, their energy is depleted. Their self-assessment of what their own quality is goes down. And so they just think that it's not worth fighting over resources because maybe you're not of high enough quality to really hold all that many resources. So defer early and save yourself time and energy. Maybe you can scrounge some desperate female from the harem some other male. So winner-loser effects, increase positive feedback loops where winners tend to keep on winning, losers tend to keep on losing, and there's some basic learning that goes into this, and also physiological stress and fatigue. So, uh, it, we, none of us want, none of us want to spend our time fighting over resources, figuring out who's stronger than who if we have to live in a society the next day, or even if we have adjacent territories and territorial species. With our own societies, what if you're kin? I don't want to waste my energy. I don't want to waste your energy because you reproducing is going to assist me indirectly. So if societies are composed of kin, it especially pays to minimize costs. But even in territorial species that live in sort of loose so social settings where I live solitarily, but I might know who my neighbors are, those, um, those individuals still don't want to waste time and energy, right? Fighting with their neighbors or whatever. Who could be familiar, be familiar individuals who might help them fight off real interlopers that are unknown later on. So um, minimizing uh, cost of both uh, winners and losers. So um, the bottom here are king cobras. I mentioned them previously, I think, but king cobras wrap around each other when the two males find each other in a territory. They try to see who's taller, and one tries to put its head, its little chin, on top of the other individual and push it down. Um, this is important to do because if there's, a, if there's a large size asymmetry, then the large individual can sometimes eat the smaller individual, and the small individual can still sometimes hurt the large individual. So no one really wants to fight for too long. They're going to try to figure out who's taller, do it in a ritualized, efficient way, and then get out of dodge. Web displacement and bouncing and, web and funnel web spiders over here. Funnel web spiders build little sheet webs and have a, cone, uh, have a little funnel in the back. Um, females that are fighting for a territory will bounce on the web and basically show how big they are. If the web displaces a lot when the female bounces, then that's a sign that she's heavy and she's big. So you should get out of dodge if she's bouncing and she's much larger than you. She's apparently very heavy. Likewise, if it's female, or conversely, if the female is very light and bounces on the web, there's very little displacement, and so that, that rival is probably less scary, less, uh, less frightening. However, most contests in these spiders vanish while they're still just assessing each other with web bouncing behavior, right? So they don't want to escalate because an escalation in these spiders oftentimes can involve injury or cannibalism, and even small females can sometimes cannibalize large females, so nobody involved really wants to fight longer than is absolutely necessary.
So hierarchies are the iterative outcome of these animal contests. You have contests over and over and over. Individuals that tend to win in disputes over and over and over assume higher ranks. Individuals that tend to lose over and over and over assume lower ranks. And then you'll contest individuals immediately around you to figure out where your precise rates, uh, which are, where your precise ranking, precise ranking is inside of your animal society. <coughs> All right, self versus mutual assessment. So we know that losers tend to like figure out that they're losers and stop fighting so hard uh, or only pick rivals that are also measly. So um, the question then becomes, how much do winners keep on winning? We know winners have high, high RHP and have behavioral indicators that they seem to know that they're of high quality and their behavioral indicators that individuals are of low quality know, seem to know that. But the question is, how much do they really know? When they're fighting an opponent, are they just, can they assess themselves and say, this is the, my quality as a combatant. I know what my quality is and I know how long I should fight based on that. Or is there a mutual assessment where like, I know what my holding potential is, but I need to pay attention to my opponent too. How strong are they? I mean, it makes sense to have mutual assessment, right? Always scale your, your relative investment in a fight, in a contest, relative to how strong your combatant is and how strong you are. But there's actually kind of so-so evidence that animals can even engage and understand that their opponent is much stronger or slightly stronger or slightly weaker than them in these animal contests. It's equivocal. People fight about this topic. So RHP, as I said before, resource hoarding potential um, is the ability for an individual, usually males, to hold desirable resources. Higher RHP, typically is a greater level of aggression you're willing to deploy because you know most combatants you fight with are gonna be losers compared to you, you're of high quality. Um, residents typically fight harder. Then the last, the last thing I wanna bring up here before pivoting into the specifics of uh, RHP and self versus mutual assessment is the desperado effect. The desperado effect is like really, really, really low quality individuals that have really low RHP, especially late in the season when they're like, they still don't have a territory and they might not reproduce at all. They have a desperado effect, which is where very low RHP individuals, usually males, are willing to throw it all in because into a contest and, fi and fight hard because they don't have anything to lose, right? So what does it matter if they get injured or they don't get a territory because they don't have a territory now. And if they don't get one, they're not gonna reproduce at all. So really low ranking individuals, well, especially when the jig is up and it's the end of the season, really fight hard. And that is called the desperado effect. All right. Relative versus absolute RHP. So we know that low RHP individuals, measly, sickly males, tend to defer quickly in contests. We know that higher high RHP individuals um, don't typically need to fight for long or hard because they're high quality. It usually gets worked out early that they're a high, uh, high quality individual, but they're willing to fight harder and can fight harder if they need to. So the questions then um, become, we know that like these combatants, we see these patterns in nature, they must be aware, at least a little bit of their quality to figure out whether or not they should escalate these contests, but how much do they know? Do they assess their, val their RHP and the RHP of the opponent, or is it just them basically figuring out where they rank in the world and then just fighting however long is relevant for that? Well, there's some theoretical predictions. So on the right-hand side here are little um, figures that show uh, the RHP of winners and losers on the x-axis and the contest duration on the y-axis. So if it's just if it's just self-assessment, if it's just me knowing how good how strong I am of a combatant, then there should be a very sharp positive relationship between my the losers. Let's say I'm the loser here. The losers resource holding potential and the duration of the contest. If the loser was very low ranking, the contest should be short. If there's a very, if the loser is a very high RHP individual, then the contest should be long. All right, so there should be a sharp relationship there. It makes sense. If the loser was weak, probably didn't fight all that long. Probably got out of dodge early. If the loser was strong, presumably the winner was strong too, or maybe, but they, they'll fight harder and for longer durations. And then this prediction also assumes a relatively weak or perhaps even an absent relationship between the winner's RHP and the contest duration. So sharp relationship between the loser's quality, it's RHP and contest duration, but only a weak relationship with the winner RHP for self-assessment. And that makes sense because it's all basically the loser's overall self-assessment that will determine the contest duration because there is no mutual assessment. The winner 
The winner knew its quality, the loser lost its quality, and the loser just fought however long it thought it was necessary based on its known perception of its own quality. If it thought it was a high-performing individual, it fights for that duration. If it thought it was a low-ranking individual of low quality, it, it fights very little, so a short contest duration. Now, if it's mutual assessment, there are moderate relationships for both of these, right? So in mutual assessment, the, uh, if the loser was of low quality, the contest is, quite, is comparatively shorter. If the loser is of high quality, the duration is, 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 is a little bit longer. But it's not as sharp as the pure assessment relationship. How sharp is sharp? How steep does it have to be? Nobody really knows. But in mutual assessment, um, the, higher quality, the, uh, the higher quality of the winner, presumably the lower, uh, the little shorter the contest duration is, because the idea is that if the loser could figure out that the winner is strong, they should get out of dodge. They should flee. So if the loser is paying attention to the winner, strong winners should result in short contest durations. If losers aren't paying attention to winners, then there should be a slight positive relationship between the winner's RHP and the duration of the contest. This is very testable, exceedingly testable. Your exam does not currently have any questions about this topic uh, for Thursday, but it is imminently testable and is the width of an eyelash away from being incorporated. If it is not, then you can bet your boots a question or two will emerge on the next exam, so please pay attention to this. There's always a positive relationship between the loser's RHP and contest duration. It's sharp for pure, pure self-assessment. It is shallow but present for mutual assessment. Um, there is a weak positive relationship between contest duration and winner RHP for pure assessment and a negative relationship for, self, uh, for mutual assessment because no one wants to fight with a very high ranking individual you should get out of dodge. If you can realize that your opponent is a fighter and you're paying attention to them. There's actually some evidence for both of these things. Most of the correlative evidence using those regressions says that um, it's mostly uh, self-assessment sickly, measly looking males, like this anolus lizard here, which is a green anole, and it's skinny and gaunt on some chain linked fence, uh, typically avoid conflicts um, with dominant individuals uh, like this. It's a heterospecific, this is a Cuban anole on the left hand side here, but patterns of contests in those in uh, many species of lizard um, are more reflective of just pure self-assessment and no mutual assessment. There are still um, loser individuals that will start contests and, and persistent contests, even modern individuals with high ranking, uh, high, high RHP individuals that should, they should engage in long contests with. And then um, experimental manipulations of like showing rival um, uh, combatants in like uh, laboratory studies, videos of combatants, teeny tiny little combatants that they, that usually are males can clearly kill actually the, the residents, the, your focal real spiders will fight very hard and tend to escalate with those teeny tiny little males. But if you show them scary looking large images of males that are moving around that might cannibalize them, usually they flee. If they're paying attention to your computer stimulus and they are fighting with the small one and running away from the big one, then that is some evidence that they're paying attention to the quality of this combatant because when you ramp it up, they're leaving, they're getting out of dodge. So there's experimental evidence that um, shows that mutual assessment is present in lots of systems where it's been investigated, but most of the correlative evidence from the, from the, from the field suggests that just self-assessment is, is, is sufficient to explain most of the patterns of contest duration that we see in nature. And duration is correlated with the level of escalation. So um, some complaints about this, these slopes, like on the left-hand side here, well, how sharp does it have to be of a relationship between loser RHP and contest duration to differentiate between the top and the bottom one? Mm. And what do you do if on the right-hand side, those lines are both flat, or if it's just like a weak positive or weak negative relationship, it can be really hard to differentiate those two statistically, unless you have a large sample size on the right. And on the left, it's totally arbitrary. So like, these correlative sorts of basic predictions based on what we see coming out of contest durations, it's not, it can be difficult to differentiate between these two things. Experimental evidence like pharmacologically depleting individuals' qualities or hypertrophying combatants, these regularly support uh, mutual assessment, but you, it's not clear whether or not the manipulations that you're doing in these little videos or pharmacologically are actually reflective of what would happen in nature. It's just sort of a proof of concept of what could happen hypothetically. So the jury's still out. People really fight about this. 
if I guess if you're interested in knowing what animals know, how much information they have, how cerebral are they, are, are they, how much do they detect their world, the mutual assessment argument basically suggests that they're more aware of their world. They're paying attention to external stimuli, they're evaluating relative to some sort of an internal standard, and so they're making more sophisticated calculations. Um, the self-assessment is basically just like they current know, they know their, their, their own state, they're basically just robotic um, in these contests and they just figure out what threshold they should give up in a contest and then get out at that point. So if you're interested in like how cerebral the lizard is, then this is an important question. Um, and, and it's worth thinking about, you know, how integrated animals are into their world cognitively and behaviorally. But we don't have a solution to this. It seems like it's both, but it's hard to tell. <laughs> All right, dominance hierarchies are much harder than just knowing your quality and your quality of your opponent. There are lots of other considerations because you might be fighting a group of foes within your own group. And you have to figure out, okay, how many allies do I have around right now? How, what are their qualities like? How many foes uh, what, uh, do I have around? And what's their, what's their coalition like? So now not only do I need to know my rank and my quality and your rank and your quality, but I might need to be able to have to sum up all of the um, strengths of your coalition against my own and then try to figure out whether or not I should stage a coup right now or not. So that is much more cognitively demanding. Which fosters two hypotheses that we will just mention now, put a finger, uh, put, put a pin in. <laughs> put a pin in. God help me. And then uh, we'll come back to this af after the next um, uh, Test. So, because there's so many computational problems with combatants uh, that you have to contend with um, in group settings and their quality, it's generally thought that living inside of uh, highfalutin integrated animal societies will foster the evolution of greater cognitive performance and intelligence. This begets two general hypotheses, the social intelligence hypothesis, which basically argues the complexities of living in a society and in these highly, high, highly um, integrated systems with dominance hierarchies and coalitions and friends and foes, that this sort of thing will foster greater social intelligence and possibly general intelligence overall, if those things are different. And then this also fosters another, another common hypothesis, which is sort of its darker brethren, the, Machiavell the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis, which argues that the uh, social benefits of deceiving individuals and manipulating them, manipulating them favors the evolution of greater intelligence. They're sort of related. The first one's sort of agnostic to whether or not you're helping or hurting individuals. Maybe it's nice things that are fostering greater intelligence, but the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis is squarely on the negative. It's you deceiving and manipulating. Oh, I mean, if you think those are negative things, deceiving and manipulating individuals that, um, and the benefits thereof that fosters greater intelligence inside of animal social groups. So I will leave it there. You have an exam in a couple of days. I'm going to have a live lecture on Wednesday where I basically just answer questions and I'll try to make no real new ground on content, but you should come. Um, it'll, be, it'll be a Zoom meeting and I'll send out the invitation reasonably soon. Hopefully this worked out. Hopefully this recorded. Stop sharing and stop my videos. See you guys soon. Take care. Bye.